This is a Word, a podcast from Slate. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. One of the most enduring icons of so-called all-American beauty is the Barbie doll. Blonde, blue-eyed, impossibly thin, and of course, white. Now a new documentary highlights the creation of Black Barbies and how they helped to change how Black girls looked at themselves. Black Barbie is about representation and that kind of like self-determination and intergenerational conversations. Black Barbie, a documentary coming up on A Word with me, Jason Johnson. Stay with us. Welcome to A Word, a podcast about race and politics and everything else. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. Barbie isn't real, but she's one of the most famous women in the country, if not the world. And with a star-studded film coming out this summer, she's back at the center of the cultural conversation. Hey, Barbie. Can I come to your house tonight? Sure. I don't have anything big planned, just a giant blowout party with all the Barbies and plant choreography and a bespoke song. You should stop by. So cool. Barbie's one of the very first brands many American girls are immersed in. For decades, millions of kids have been collecting the dolls and everything that comes with her. The clothes, the dream house, and the pink convertible. And like so many white celebrities, she had a handful of black friends. But they were in the background of her life. Now, the creation of the Black Barbie and what it meant for the culture is the topic of a new documentary. Legeria Davis is a writer and a producer and the creator of the new film Black Barbie, a documentary. She joins us now. Legeria Davis, welcome to A Word. Hi, thank you so much. There's this big Barbie movie coming out. You know, you go to a movie theater anytime in the last month and a half, and there's giant Barbie booths, and everyone's familiar. But if you see the Black Barbie documentary, if people aren't familiar with it yet, and they will be, what are they going to see in your film? What's the contrast between your documentary and the big pink cavalcade that's been forced down our throats in popular advertising for the last six weeks? Well, everything won't be pink for sure. But, you know, I think what you'll see with our film is like everything that's Black Barbie. And it is bright, bold colors. And we'll see the intentionality and the celebration that she as a doll just has not been given so far. All that attention and love. We want to show the world just some Black Barbie love and celebrate the women behind the first Black Barbie and the Black Barbies that came after her. Legeria, for you, the Black Barbie story is also in part a family story. Tell us a little bit about Beulah Mae Mitchell and your connection to her and her connection to Barbie and eventually Black Barbie. Okay, yes. My aunt is 85 years young. Today, she's a bit of a whippersnapper. Um, She's such a warm, never has met a stranger, can talk to a tree type personality. And so I had met my aunt twice, maybe before moving to California. She let me come stay with her for a couple of months while I got my bearings. And that is when I got the chance to really sit down and get to know her. And that's when she told me her story about working at Mattel on that first Barbie line and was so excited about this doll. You can hear it when, you know, she's talking about it in the movie. I can't remember having a black black doll when I was a little girl. Not even a black baby doll. Not even a black baby doll. I'm almost sure all my dolls, I, for Christmas, we got white dolls. When you were seven or eight, and did you really, really want a black doll? Did it I, ever? I didn't, it it didn't occur to me. It was just a doll. When people see me now and I have more black dolls than I have white dolls, now it's no big thing to people because they expect it. (laughs) And was also struck by asking the question of, well, why not make a Barbie that looks like me? Why not make a black Barbie? And, you know, listening to her story, For me, as a filmmaker, I was like, oh, one, I never even knew about Black Barbie. Two, I didn't know that Black Barbie had a story. And once I found out that she did and my aunt was connected to it, I was like, I have to tell this story. And it was a really 
funny process just because my aunt is like, I'm a peon. I'm a nobody. I didn't do anything. What are you talking about? You're going to make a documentary about me. And so I think it's interesting. We have people who say sometimes these types of things are taken for granted, the groundwork that our elders have laid to make this type of progress. Black Barbie of documentary really revolves around sort of these three women. You get to see these women interact with each other. Besides your aunt, who are the other two women that really sort of helped bring Black Barbie to life? And, and what was that like? Barbie came out in 1959. My aunt started working at Mattel in 1955. And so the story kind of lays out what it meant for my aunt to be in that space and move from the assembly line to the corporate offices, which then in 1976, Mattel would hire their first Black woman designer, Kitty Black Perkins. And with Kitty, a couple of days after working there, she meets my aunt and they get to talking. And, you know, it's really funny. I think there's a part in the film where my aunt is like, yeah, Kitty was like, don't you think they should be able to make like a black Barbie with Afrocentric like features? Like, and she was like, that was on Kitty's mind. And so four years after Kitty comes into um, play, you know, we get the very first black Barbie that she herself designs. And from that point on, she started to get all this publicity and then articles written about her. And the third young woman that we speak with is Stacy McBride Irby, who sees Kitty and tracks her career through these articles. And since she sees another Black woman doing the thing that she wanted to grow up to do, she ends up going to school for design and then being hired by Kitty. We're going to take a short break and we come back more on Black Barbie, a documentary. This is A Word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today, we're talking about Black Barbie, a documentary with director Nigeria Davis. Black dolls are not just about play. There was a famous study about racial attitudes amongst black kids using different dolls that played a major role in the Brown versus Board of Education decision, ending legal segregation in public schools. For folks who aren't familiar with the black doll test, tell us a little bit about it and how you sort of did a modern version, a really interesting part, I I will admit, in the documentary of of the black doll test and and what you discovered in in making your documentary. So the black doll test was done in the 1940s by Mamie and Kenneth Clark. And so, you know, we kind of set the ground in the first act with introducing this and trying to unpack in the sense what you just said about toys, not just being toys for the sake of being toys, that they can leave impacts on children. And I felt like as a part of the story, to kind of get a measure and beat on how much progress had been made as Black children and their self-reflection and image, it would make sense to talk to kids today and get their thoughts. And for context, for those who may not understand, when it came to Brown versus Board of Education, you had these videos that were done and you had Black kids and they were handed dolls, white dolls and Black dolls. And they were asked, you know, which one is the smart doll? Which one is the ugly doll? And these black children were consistently picking all of the positive adjectives to be connected with the white doll. And when they were asked, you know, well, why can't the black doll be pretty? The kids were like, because that's the black one. It was used by the courts to basically say, look, these black children are being harmed by being separated. They're getting these images of whiteness that are damaging their psyche. And so that's why it was sort of this really compelling case. What's fascinating, and I'm curious about this, Nigeria, when you were you know doing this part of the documentary, is you had a collection of kids. So rather than just having you know a couple of black children look at dolls, you had like what appeared to be really young black girls, like girls who were probably between five and seven. Then it seemed like you had another group that might have been closer to ten. Then you had black boys, and then you had young Asian girls all give their opinions on the beauty and the individuality of the dolls. Why did you decide to sort of diversify by age and gender 
the kids who looked at these black Barbies. It didn't make any sense to really try to create another forced choice test and duplicate that test. So, you know, going into it, I was thinking in terms of like rethinking, reimagining this test. And so once we found Dr. Amira Safir to come in to kind of speak, because I'm not a scientist, and I gave her some thoughts on what it was that we would like to do, she was like, okay. What could be interesting is just getting a group of kids with their peers that they feel comfortable with talking with and just have a conversation with these kids, ask some questions and just kind of hear what they have to say. And I will say we were very surprised. Tell me which one is the prettiest one to you. The prettiest one to me, Mm -hmm. I think, is... Um, Brooklyn. Brooklyn's the prettiest? Yeah. Why do you think she's the prettiest? Because she has black skin like all of us. Oh, she does have black skin like all of us. That's true. That's very true. And she also has a unique ability to play the guitar. And it just made sense also to kind of tap into the different age groups. Like, we have the younger kids in that, you know, four to you know, six, where they're like, what's race, you know? Um, But then as they got older, you know, the group seven to nine, 10 to 12, like you could see that evolution of identity and they had more of the language, they had more of an understanding. And so I felt like that was important to kind of also just show a variety, if that makes sense. Another segment, and I thought this was really, really powerful. You spoke with dozens of people, and one of the people you talked to was Aziz McKenzie Johnson, who said that having a doll, a black Barbie, helped her endure being the only black girl in her community. And I want to play this clip, and we're going to talk about it on the other side. Um, And there was nothing that I can relate to when I would watch television that I could associate myself and find an escape from the reality that was beating me up because of the way I look. Because most kids escape to television, but whenever I would watch TV, everyone was still white. And when I finally started seeing a few shows where there were black people, they were always poor. It was always a reminder of the struggle is always going to be real for you. So when Black Barbies finally came on the market, she represented success. She represented beauty, and I could see possibility in her for myself. The little white girls had, they could see possibility in their Barbies. I would look in that Barbie, and I would try to see possibility, but I'd be reminded through my reality that that's not your possibility because you're Black. And uh, when Black Barbie came out, I was like, no, I think it is possible for me. So I, I don't all the haters out there can kick rocks because it did a lot for me. Black Barbies did a lot for me. The interesting thing about this is Mackenzie Johnson is literally a beauty queen, but you could hear her crying, like the emotions welling up in her because she did not feel beautiful. What are some of the stories that women in particular told you and some men about what Black Barbie did for them emotionally, what Black Barbie did for them psychologically? Because that's one of the other powerful parts of the documentary. Exactly. I feel like it goes so much like further and just beyond beauty. And I remember being struck by ISIS. Of course, these are all, you know, testimonies and the sense of me just, you know, being a witness and, you know, trying to create a safe space for them to share with us. I remember sitting on the opposite side of ISIS, looking at how beautiful she is and that she, like you said, a former beauty queen, you know, but Like I said, I felt like it goes beyond beauty, but also identifying with the self-worth, the validation of being just seen as a person and their struggles, the struggles of combating that outside world and these narratives that were kind of socially conditioned. I think we all have this. And so it really felt like to me, That beyond the beauty, it speaks to the psychology of not seeing yourself authentically represented. She talks about success. You know, she was like, I could imagine being successful and getting out of Watts 
and you know seeing this black barbie if black barbies can do it and become a part of the barbie verse you know then i can do things in this world there have been black dolls before barbie and there have been black doll companies before barbie what were some of those dolls and what happened to them why did black barbie become so dominant when there were black dolls that existed before her Before Mattel would release Black Barbie, they released a handful of Black fashion dolls that had names. In my words, you know, they weren't worthy of the Barbie brand. Like the very first one, I believe, came out in 1967. She was called Colored Francie. And so we had this rollout of dolls that weren't Barbie. And some would say Christy is the first, like, Black Barbie. But we know that she wasn't because even... In Mattel's history, the very first Black Barbie is called Black Barbie, (laughs) and she was released in 1980. And so through my research and what we uncovered was that Operation Bootstraps was born out of the Watts riots in California, and they had a toy company called Shindana, the Shindana Toy Company. And what they ended up doing was making baby dolls and they had a black fashion doll. Their toys were very intentional in the sense of they were making toys for all races, but then also for black kids. And so with that at the forefront and driving the company, I think they saw a level of success and would end up going out of business in 1983, three years after the first Black Barbie was released. And so, you know, Yolanda Hester in our film, an oral historian, she points out that basically Shindana Toy Company created the model that then the bigger toy companies was like, oh, they have tapped into this market in a way that we, one, thought there wasn't really a market for. I remember the Shawnee series of dolls that came out in the 90s. Shawnee is here. Shawnee, Shawnee. You walk, you smile. You got style. It's Shawnee and friends. So hot. We love all the books you've got. What struck me about the Shawnee dolls is they introduced the idea of diversified skin color and black women dolls. Talk a little bit about how significant that was because, you know, Black Barbie came out in one color, but the Shawnee dolls did something different about sort of blackness and and texture and things like that. Kitty Black Perkins, she did the first Black Barbie, and that was, again, kind of like a test market for Mattel. And like you said, in the 1990s, she was able to, I believe it's 1991, she was able to release the Shawnee line with even more so intention that did include the different shades, different hairstyles. And what's really interesting about this is over the course of many iterations of kind of like Black Barbies and other dolls, we see the evolution of kind of like the Black portrayals and how the different gazes can shape it. And that's why it's so important to have that particular gaze and lens in the space creating these toys. Without that, we wouldn't have had the Shawnee line. We're going to take a short break and we come back more about Black Barbie, a documentary. This is A Word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today, we're talking with Ligeria Davis, director of Black Barbie, a documentary. I want you to talk a little bit about pushback because there are people who are sort of offended, usually white racists, but people who are offended by the idea that Barbie now has to share that name with black women and with Asian women. There was a a Barbie cartoon, I guess it was like on YouTube, like a couple of years ago that, you know, there were two Barbies. There was both, there was a black girl and a white girl who both called themselves Barbie. It was sort of breaking down this idea that Barbie, the original Barbie is white. No, all these Barbies are equal. What kind of pushback did these three women talk about facing as they were creating Black Barbie? And what kind of pushback did you hear from people today about the existence of Black dolls or the importance of Black dolls or 
the role that they should play in the sort of identity forming of, of Black children? Oh, yeah. The pushback is real. <laughs> I don't know what else to say in the sense of how it's so challenging to be able to share the space and allow for other experiences and other voices. And I feel like it just goes back to what I said about being able to show how we see and relate to people who don't look like us. And sometimes there's just not that relatability from the other side of the table. Like talking in terms of authentic, you know, we have our group of researchers that are paired with the kids who kind of break down what we're seeing with the kids. And we talk about what does authentic inclusion and diversity looks like. And we're building our own tables to sit at and we're being invited. I'm saying this in air quotes to sit at certain tables, but only if we share a like-mindedness with the people who are opposite of us, we can come to this in an authentic way and say, hey, this is important. It's about diversity of thoughts. It's not just checking a box and doing a scroll test like, oh, this is woke toy aisle. But what really is the intention behind this woke toy aisle? It's serving a certain, you know, capitalist and not authentic in the intention. So I think the film really sets the stage of what it looks like to have that intention and how it speaks to a certain community and the communities involved with that amount of intention put behind it and authenticity put behind it. When you talk about intentionality, when you talk about authenticity, you know, it's a twist in the documentary when we find out that the creative person who is in charge of the Black Barbie anniversary doll is a white dude. What did Mattel tell you about how that happened? How did a white guy end up being responsible for making the anniversary Black Barbie? And and what are some things that some of the analysts and researchers and Black men and women that you spoke to, what was their reaction to that? That is one of the documentaries kind of like, <gasps> cut out your pearls moment when we're with audiences. Like they really aren't expecting for the legacy of Black Barbie to be interrupted in that way because it really is so rich and beautiful. And so Mattel hasn't told me anything. You know, I I don't know any kind of intention on their part, so I can't speak to that. But for me personally, I feel like they didn't have a person like my aunt in the space. You know what? Black Barbie has a story, and this is a really great legacy story that if it really mattered, this is something that you would care to keep going with. Like, let's preserve this. Let's mentor someone else, another Black woman, to then carry this into the 40th anniversary. So it is a a gasp moment when that part is revealed and it's like, oh, wow. And personally, and you can tell in the the documentary, my comment, I was just, you know, sad and just like, this is important and you're treating it like it's not. And if your bottom line is the intention, I think that preserving this could serve your bottom line as well. If somebody's listening to this conversation right now, and they're wondering, how can I be intentional about the kinds of dolls or figurines that I get for my little black boy or girl? What would you tell them? I think as someone who I don't have kids, I do have nieces, and I bought them black dolls. I feel like that question's hard for me to answer. Someone did ask me in a Q&A about would I buy dolls for my kid? I just answered with, I would want to listen to my kid. I would want to encourage my child to be and grow into their most authentic self and be fearless in expressing their most authentic self, embracing what it is that makes them them. And it starts with these types of choices, in my opinion and being able to listen to my kids in that respect. So that's what I would say. 
to that. And, you know, we're in the process of trying to get our film out there to the widest audience possible in the way of some form of distribution. So I would say support Black Barbie, a documentary. Let's show up for Black Barbie, a documentary. Like we showing up for The Little Mermaid, Black Panther, The Woman King. Let's go out there and show that content made by Black people, for Black people, about Black people is the content that we want to see and put our money behind. Nigeria Davis is the director of Black Barbie, a documentary. She joined us today on A Word. Thank you so much, Nigeria. I really, really enjoyed this documentary and had a great time in this conversation. Yes, likewise, Jason. And that's A Word for this week. The show's email is a word at slate.com. This episode was produced by Ayana Angel. Ben Richmond is Slate's Senior Director of Podcast Operations. Alicia Montgomery is the Vice President of Slate Audio. Our theme music was produced by Don Will. I'm Jason Johnson. Tune in next week for Word.